that um, came up at the board meeting, Vince said, we're paying for Zoom. Mm -hmm. So why don't we use Zoom more often? We're using it for our board meetings and for this general meeting, but is there another way that we might be able to use Zoom and benefit our members? So um, Vince thought it might be a nice idea to have an art critique. Yay! So we haven't <laughs> had that in a while. And um, so Carol was going to look into finding someone who could um, be a, not a judge, but a good um, art critic, I guess. And then we'll figure out, you'll have to submit a photograph of your artwork. We'll let you know where. And one of us will put together a PowerPoint presentation so that each piece can come up. We can give that to the person who's going to be making comments ahead of time so they can have a quick look on that and see and see what they want to say. But that won't be at our regular meeting time. We're going to have that as a, at a separate time. So we will, again, send you out an e-blast on that. Uh, so look look for that. We're thinking, I don't know, maybe March, April um, when we get it organized. So we'll, we'll keep you abreast of that. Deanna, I see that you're on now. Um, I told everyone that they needed to contact you or look for the time that they need to pick up their artwork. Is there anything else that you would like to say regarding the Aquarius show? The, the, uh, the list is made, the calls have been made, everybody's got appointments. So okay. I'm all set. All I have to do is send a list out to everybody to remind them when their time is. Oh, great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that again will be an e-blast uh -huh. um, that comes out to you uh, in time. And you'll know that it'll be sometime either the Monday, March 1st or Tuesday, March 2nd. Right. So what was there, that was the dates, correct, Deanna? That's right. Okay. All right. Hi, Joe. Um, Hi. So I think that was all I was going to cover with the business part of it. Does anybody have any old business or new business they would like to bring up? I do. Um, any shows that anybody knows about that they think they should? Yes, Betty, did you have something? Yeah, um, Deanna and I have the, um, the breakdown of the finances for the Aquarius show, if you'd like to hear that quickly. Sure. Um, the income from registration that's been deposited was $940, as I mentioned in the um, treasurer's report. We still have one check that we know we're gonna receive for $20. So that'll bring our total income from the Aquarius show to $960. Our expenses totaled $875.47. So the Aquarius show had a profit of $85.53. <clears throat> And, and that also takes into account the $50 that we will be paying for the People's Choice Award. Great, good. Thank you very much, both of you. Any other business? Kathy, um, this is Vince. I'd just like to say um, on behalf of uh, myself and Bonnie, anything that you guys would like to have in the newsletter or on the website, please send it to us. We're always looking for new material to put up to keep our website fresh and to keep our newsletter fresh. So um, we count on you guys to, to help uh, feed the feed the pot. So uh, keep us in mind. Yeah, and if you're teaching a class, put that up in the um, newsletter. So, um, and again, any shows that are coming up that you know of that our members might be interested in, all of that is very pertinent information. So, great. Um, hey, hey, Kathy? Yes, Daryl. Yeah, I just want to let people know also with coal beans, um, we usually start that in April. That's to be the first show. It's a two month show, and I change it after two months. I had last year sign up sheets still. We didn't have it last year. So, um, the first one will be probably around April 2nd, something like that, first Wednesday of the month. But I, I'll get some information out to Bonnie for the newsletter about that also. 
uh, so we can try to get that started again in April. Okay. I hope to have my second shot by then. Um, <laughs> Oh, so I'll feel a little bit more comfortable out and about in a place like that, sitting around for an hour or so, you know, yeah. taking the taking the work in and hanging it up over right. those booths. Yeah. So that's the plan anyway. That sounds good. Any the, the, the people that signed up last year, I will contact to see if they're still interested. The first one is called the theme for the first show is still life. Okay. So if anybody is interested in you know submitting a, a, a still life piece of art. Uh, for cold beans, let me know. Great, good. Um, and then I guess the other thing, I guess, since we have so many people on, I will say that Bonnie, who has been doing the newsletter um, very nicely for quite a while, it would like to step down. And Vince has offered to go from secretary to newsletter uh, editor. So we will need a secretary. So if you um, know of anybody or, uh, or would like to step up, it's a, it's, um, it's a wonderful board to work with and we would appreciate anybody who would be willing to do that. So let Daryl or myself or any of the board members know. That would be great, thanks. Okay, Carol. Yes. Would you introduce our wonderful speaker for tonight? Um, I would love to. I would love to. And before I do that, I want to ask Vince a question. Did you get the little video that I sent of Joan's introductory? Yes, that's the last one you sent. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did. Would, okay, would... that's that's the one we want to do first. Okay. Um, as as she introduces herself i'm going to do a little you know just a short introduction but she's going to introduce herself as that video is playing okay then we'll go to the powerpoint of her um her work and and she'll talk about that as that's going and then the last one will be the video of uh the demonstration of the the um, process of making the, the block print <laughs> Okay. I have to say, if you all don't know, Carol and Vince have put a lot of time in behind the scenes learning to put these um, oh. events on because the artist is also learning to do PowerPoint or video and then we have to get them and figure out how we're presenting them too and so that everyone can see them. So it. Yeah. it Takes a lot of effort behind the scenes, but they're doing a fantastic job. So well, I, I'm going to bow to Vince right here because I'm, you know, emailing him in a panic. Vince, can you do this? I can't make this work. What do I do? Help me. You know. So he's so patient and kind <laughs> with me, and so competent. He talks me down off ledges all the time. So <laughs> bless your heart. And bless then your heart. <laughs> I, I bow to your expertise and your calm helpfulness. Okay, so Joan. And what, one more thing, please. If you can uh, mute your uh, little microphone on the bottom of your... So I, can you hear me? Yeah, we, we lost Kathy. Okay. She went, she went mute. Um, I think what she was trying to, to say is that if you're, uh, well, during the presentation, if you could please hit the mute button on the bottom left hand of your screen <laughs> while uh, our presenter is presenting, that would be wonderful. Joan? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so Joan, Joan Colbert is a wonderful printmaker, mixed media artist who has been um, associated, affiliated with Summit Art Space for a long, long time. That's where I first met her and just fell in love with her work. I visited her on Saturday and just walking into her studio, I thought it would be wonderful just to just so you can get a little overview of where she is at Summit Art Space on the first floor. Um, please go visit her sometime. Um, it, anyway, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Joan and let her talk a little bit about herself and her process and whatever thoughts come to your mind, Joan, to talk about, just do it. <laughs> uh, I, just wanna, 
<laughs> Here's Joan. I'm going to mute Carol. myself now. And Joan, you're taking over. Can I just verify that everyone is seeing the screen? No, I'm not. I don't know what I did. Lane, Lamb. I can't. Um, I can well, see it. I when you muted, maybe you. Yeah, when I muted, I did something, but it's okay. I can't figure it out. Oh, now I'm on it, a page that says read the report. Call Bill. <laughs> yeah, it's the city council. <laughs> oh. I'll try well, to figure it out. You know I'll what? go back. Okay. Remute re your, or unmute. Well, what am I saying? Put yourself back on. I'm trying to do that, but not on the see. Lam, you probably hit the video and put a line through the video that's right next to the mute. Yeah, I don't even see the mute button. I'll go back and see if I can do something. That's the, the mute is a little oval, like mic thing. That's what I hit, I thought. But I okay, then that. next to that is a video, and you may have hit that by mistake. Yeah, I don't see anything like that anymore. I'm on a page that looks like an advertisement. So I'm going to go back and see if I can figure it out. Okay. Go ahead, do your thing, and I'll just look at this. All right, I'm going to begin the video now. Well, you could just watch the video and then I'll talk after it. It's Carol opening the door. <laughs> Ooh. This is, I just moved into this space a year ago just in time for the building to close. Um, this is on the first floor of Summit Art Space. Oh. <laughs> that was it. Now behind me on the video is actually where I do my work, so. Okay. Hold on while I switch to the PowerPoint. There we are. Okay. Everyone see the PowerPoint now? Yeah. Very good. Just let me know when you want me to change slides, Joan. No, oh, I'm sure you can figure it out. Um, okay. I'm going to kind of talk related to what are, what are on these because I feel that most people can probably read it. Um, I'm not going to read what's on the screen. Um, I decided to do my most recent series. And by recent, I mean five or six years I've been adding to it. Um, it was inspired by gardening, herbs, and the dark side of all of those plants. So I titled it as Potent as a Charm. All of the prints you'll see are relief prints on the linoleum. And all of the plants, or most of the plants, are poisonous. You can go to the next one. And this is just exactly what I said. Um, I was struck by how many plants in my garden, in gardens I know of, are poisonous. It's not just, you know, some of the obvious ones you think of, like hemlock or whatever. Many, many, many of the plants in your garden, um, just don't eat them. Um, black hellebore, the Christmas rose, and pretty soon will those that garden will be seeing the Lenten rose. Uh, hellebores are very poisonous, and my favorite story from them was that, um, well, they think possibly Alexander the Great died from a medicinal dose of it, maybe on purpose, maybe not. Uh, the other one was the Greek soldiers. Um, this is also conjecture, but they're pretty sure this happened, that they tainted the water supply of a town they were attacking, the town of Kira, 
And should this be true, it's probably the first instance of chemical warfare. They tainted it with hellebores. So I really didn't know hellebores were that poisonous, but they are. Um, the next one. The title of it, As Potent as a Charm, is from a sort of obscure Nathaniel Hawthorne story. It's very odd. Uh, you might even be able to get it free on Kindle. It's part of a group, it's a short story about Beatrice who has attends her father's garden. Um, and of course, there's a young man who sees Be Beatrice in the garden. It is a very, very strange story. Um, the plants, are poisonous and in true Hawthorne style, Beatrice isn't quite all she seems either. So I took the line as potent as a charm was about the plants, but I thought that would be a good title for this series. Okay. The first series, I, the first grouping I did, this is quite a few years, I was reading some, This is and this helped kind of get me started. I was reading about the, this old monomic of the um, symptoms for really atropine poisoning, but poisoning in general. And so young med students would re, um, read these, hot as a hair, obviously is fever, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. And I thought, wow, this would really be great to illustrate you know, th these various plants that could fit in this. I do have to confess on the next five slides that they are not all from the gym. Um, they're not all from the nightshade family with atropine. A couple of them are indeed poisonous, but I used some artistic license to fit in with the, the thing. So just in case anybody's a botanist here, I'll say, no, that is not a nightshade, but three of them I think are. So the first one would be hot as a hair. I included some sketches in that. And this um, is the first one is not a nightshade. So it does not have atropine. This is the plant in the background is uh, hemlock. Uh, some people confuse hemlock with the tree. This is the plant. Um, and the constellation in the background is the hair. So that was the first one I did. The next one is blind as a bat is the other one that's not, not a nightshade. There's no atropine, but it's very poisonous is blood root. So that, and the next one would be dry as a bone is the fiddle neck. It was really hard to find. I wanted a cactus and um, cacti aren't normally poisonous. So this one has a few poisonous traits. It's not really lethal, I don't think. Well, it might be painful, but not lethal. Um, up next would be red as a beet. This is one of my, my favorite <laughs> poisonous plants, mandrakes. Um, and so I, you can see the middle ones of beet, but the mandrakes, the roots are, are, they always have sort of a human form. And this one's been used a lot in um, witchcraft and that, and the most horrible story with it is that, I don't know, I don't know who it was, but they, maybe the Romans, this, the story is, is that if you pull up a mandrake, the screaming of the mandrake will kill you. It is so awful. So they would tie a dog to the mandrake so that the scream, the dog would be the only thing to hear them scream and then you could pick them up after they were out of the ground. It didn't really say if the screaming affected the dog. So I, it's really gruesome, but mandrakes, um, if you read anything about them, they're, they're very, very interesting, interesting plants. I've never seen one, um, but this was my interpretation. And the last one, is um, mad as a hatter. And so I thought, kind of crazy, I thought, well, that's the one that would get one of my crows. I thought the hatter is a crow would be a good illustration of it. Uh, this would be Datura, which you may know is the, um, some people call them moonflowers. The large white lilies, very poisonous. 
um, Datura is its botanical name, Jimson weed because um, it was on where the settlers were in Jamestown. And when they first landed there in whatever year that was, um, I should try to be accurate. In the early 1600s, in, there was a lot of this um, detour growing wild and it made them sick. They, you'd have to eat quite a bit to die from it. I think some did die from it, but it, um, it causes um, hallucinations and seizures. So they learned quickly not to eat this. But about 70 years later, when the British were coming in to attack the colony, they laced the soldiers' food with jimson weed leaves and knocked them out for about 11 days. And this, this I'm not making. And that's where it got the name Daytura. They started calling it Jamestown weed, and then they shortened it to jimson weed. So. It's like loco weed, they call it too. I wouldn't mess with it. it. It can kill you, but chances are you'll just, you know, be crazy for a while. <laughs> the, next, the next group, um, not all these are in groups, but the first ones are, is the queen of poisons, Aconitum. And this is the only, there's five of these, the only series, grouping that I did, that I did not illustrate the plant in any of them. There were so many, and I just chose my favorites of the um, common names for them, that I illustrated the common names. So we pro most people probably know it as monkshood, but there are other names. Um, so the next five slides will be close-ups of aconitum. Uh, first would be um, trying to think. The first one is Blue Rocket and Devil's Bane. Um, I think you can switch to the next. This shows how they all go together. So everybody can there see that they all put yeah. hang together. This will show a little bit closer. Um, Blue Rocket and Devil's Bane. Um, I call it Monk's Hood. So I'll call it Monk's Hood. Monk's Hood is a blue, a very tall spire like blue flower, so hence the blue rocket. Um, the next name for it is easy to figure out. The next slide is monk's hood. Um, the shape of the flower itself does look like a monk's robes with the hood, so hence the name. Following that, We have, I, I called it insomnia, and it's wolf's bane. The wolf is pacing the floor. Um, wolf's bane, I believe the flowers are yellow. It's a little bit of a different variety, but equally as poisonous. Following the wolf would be women's bane. And she's the night wolf. The constellation in behind her is the wolf. Um, she's also pacing the floor. And the last one is leopard spain and mouse spain. And story has it, I don't know if this one's true, but story has it, the, um, we, the leopard could die from ingesting aconitum, but a mouse only needs to smell it. Now, I don't know if that's true. I would put some in my basement if it was. <laughs> So that's, that's aconitum, that's, that's a very lethal poison. Um, about a year after I printed them, I put them together into a Nicorian book, um, the five yeah. prints. So this is just illustrating that. Angel's Trumpet, that's another, um, this is another one from the Nightshade or the Solanaceae family. Um, I don't know if you can read the, the quote, but I found this um, a very amusing quote about Angel's Trumpet because people, like, people have them outside here in the summer. It's a tropical and they bring them in, but um, the writer feels that, you know, be careful bringing them in. That may be the last sound you hear is the Angel's Trumpet. So it's another, another nightshade.
The next three, uh, which was really a surprise to me, are three landscape plants. Probably everyone has at least one of them. Um, I'm just surprised. I'm especially surprised about you um, as a plant, but the next three, I'm sure you will recognize. The first, um, be still, is the oleander, and that's some, sometimes called, I'm trying to think of the name of it. In the South, it was planted so often around nursing homes and residents knew how poisonous it was. So it's sort of a suicide plant or can be. Of course, it's known for its flowers and its blooms um, all over the South. It's very, you know, planted a lot and it's very, very poisonous. Following that one is the yew, which it just used to be in front of every single house, I swear, the you. Every single part of it is poisonous, which I thought was kind of odd how many suburbs had it with children and everything. Every part's poisonous and I'm not sure that there's an antidote. The only thing is, is that I don't think it would be very tasty. So most you know, children would be interested in eating it, but the you is, is quite toxic. And the last one is rhododendron. What? Um, it also is poisonous. I learned also that in the British Isles, it can be highly invasive, invasive where it just smothers out everything else that's growing. The pictures online were quite beautiful, but nothing else can grow there. And there's areas where hikers, if they get off the track, they can just become trapped in it all. The other problem with rhododendron, and I don't know that it's a problem in the United States, but in these areas where it's growing very rampant, the honey would also be poisonous if that's all the bees are feeding off of. Huh. So that's, those are three. So you, you now you know, they're in front of your house. <laughs> this one's pretty, um, Self-explanatory mistletoe, kissing under the mistletoe it is also poisonous. It, it's also um, grows on a host tree. I did not know that. That um, They're rather attractive, the pictures of them in the winter, but they can choke out trees. They just grow, um, I can't remember the name of plants that do that. I thought they grew, you know, like a shrub or something, but there'll be these big balls of mistletoe up in, up in the trees. Um, so it's, it's not real good for trees, but I haven't seen any around here. I'm curious. I asked someone, they think that maybe it's a little too cold here for it. I'm not sure. Back to the nightshades again. Um, this was a really fun section of them to do. The nightshades, which is the Solanaceae family, and as you can probably read while I'm talking, they consist of really terrible poisons and staples in our diet, which just, I don't know, I still can't get over how many people had to experiment to figure out which of the nightshades were edible such as tomatoes and which would kill you. Um, and as you see at the bottom, there's over 2,500 species. So it was a lot, you know, a lot of experimentation with this. I did read that um, Europeans, when they first came to the United, to the United States, when they first came to America, they would not eat tomatoes. They had been always considered them poisonous. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, we do eat them. So the next, the next ones will all be um, combinations, what I set out to do, and there's also an error in this one, which I will, which I will correct, uh, teach me not to cut and paste to save, uh, save time. Um, each of the next six um, prints contains a poisonous plant and a counterpoint that's not poisonous, but they all are the same family. And I think if you're out, like if you look at the 
looms on some of them that you're familiar with and then say a um, woody nightshade bloom. Everybody I think has that. It's the weed, the weed type of nightshade. Um, and a tomato bloom, they're very similar. I just never, it never dawned on me. So the first one's love, love, Loves Me Not. That's Deadly Nightshade is in the framed picture. Deadly Nightshade is the one that um, women would put drops in their eyes to blacken them. Um, it's very, very poisonous. I did have it in my, I, have, I do have a small poison garden. Um, I did have it one year, but it didn't bloom. I just had, and the leaves were rather nondescript, but it gets a black, like dark, dark purple, blackish um, berry in the center of the flower that is mm -hmm. very, very poisonous. Um, coupled with loves in Loves Me Not is the base of petunias. Petunias are also a nightshade. And I don't know, I got to thinking about petunias. You know, petunias never hold up as a cut flower. They're just, you know, something planted outside. I don't know if that's something to do with being a nightshade. I don't know. The second one, <clears throat> Deceitful Charm, is uh, Detour is lying on the table. Not Deadly Nightshade, sorry about that. And hanging on the chandelier are the little Chinese lanterns, which are not particularly poisonous. So I combined those two, the Daytura, which we saw before with um, Madison Hatter. And the third one on this one is Bittersweet. The wallpaper is Woody Nightshade. That's very common weed. Um, it's little purple and yellow flowers. And on the, on the table is the tomato. So those are the first three of the pairings. And then next slide. Um, the mandrake makes another appearance um, up at the top. They, they have been pulled out of the ground. They are chasing the dog with potato, which a potato is a nightshade. Um, that's, I remember always being told when, as a kid, you know, if we were peeling potatoes, my mother would always say, don't leave any green on them. And I would always think it was an old, old wives tale, but technically it's not. It could upset your stomach, um, the potatoes and that. So I paired the two root ones together in that one. For smoking hot, we have tobacco hanging in the back, which is a poison and chili pepper, both are nightshades. And the, the third one, best laid plans is henbane, which is a yellow, it has a yellow bloom and it kind of has a center like the, like the deadly nightshade. Um, and I paired it with eggplant, which is down in the basket. Henbane also has some um, interesting, interesting lore. Um, it was considered a poison of the ancients. It was used um, as a narcotic or as a lethal poison. If anybody's read um, Eric Larson's book, Thunderstruck, um, Dr. Holly Hoff Harvey, what's his name? Crippen in um, Britain, uh, killed his wife with henbane and with his lover came transatlantic, came to, tried to come to Canada. And it was the first trans oceanic, um, they used, the, I can't remember what Marconi called it. The first time that they could call ahead using, oh, I made a note of it, Marconi gram which um, sort of like a telegram, but this is the first use and the, the, the um, authorities were waiting for him when they got off the, off the boat. Um, so it also is, you know, it has been in some other poisonings. It's, it's another good one. So that's it for the nightshade family and they're good relatives. Mm, Fox glove. I think this is one of my very, one of my one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's such a beautiful flower, mm -hmm. uh, and you may know it as digitalis. But too much of it, it would be would be lethal. 
Foxglove, I won't take up the whole evening. Foxglove has more stories and folk tales than any of the other plants. Some of them are just lovely. Um, they involve fairies and bells and foxes. It's just, it's just lovely, but poisonous. And the next, the next four uh, are trees and they're not, they are poisonous to a degree, um, but probably not as poisonous as some of the, some of the ground, the lower plants. Um, this is the yew again. In England, the yews are, they grow into trees. I really don't know if we have them growing as trees here. They always seem to be clipped into hedges and that. But they often were planted around churches in that, not necessarily um, because they're poisonous. It's just they were planted around there. And some of them, they just live for hundreds and hundreds of years. So they, there's a lot of folklore about them too and their roots and, and that. So silence, I paired the, the churchyard you with an owl. The next tree, and there's a lot of, this one was inspired by local, the local uh, black locust trees. There's a lot of those in Akron. And I seem, I'm in West Akron, I'm sort of on a route. Um, a lot of us are, I mean, everybody here is. The crows in the fall, winter, and very early spring go to a roost. I'm not sure where they go, or I think it's south of here. Um, but at dusk and at dawn, especially at dusk, some evenings, you'll just see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crows going over. It is quite awesome. And sometimes they stop on their way, and anybody with a, a blackbird thing would not care for it but they stop and uh fill up the trees like the whole neighborhood will be filled with noisy crows in the trees so i paired the uh, i love the shape of the black locust in the winter it's kind of a halloween looking tree mm -hmm. um it is poisonous to livestock um but i thought it would make a nice accompaniment to the crows going over at uh dusk the next, the next one is the elder, elderberry. Um, that's also a very, very popular tree in Irish lore. Um, it is the month of December on the um, Celtic calendar. All sorts of stories of myths and that of the elder tree. Um, elderberries though, you know, are poisonous unless they're cooked. Uh, you, you have to be careful with it. As this says also, um, burning it will raise the devil. It's, it just has so many, so many stories. So it is considered poisonous. Um, but of course, you know, we elderberry pie and elderberry jam, which is on the next one. That's because they're fully ripened and cooked. Um, I think I have a picture of the sketch is the next one. And this was the caution of making sure that berries are completely ripened and, and cooked. And the last one was, um, I started with the trees, but I tried to find some, a bird to pair them with. Uh, English laurel, this is one from uh, anybody that likes murder mysteries and that. Uh, cherry laurel water and that. Um, the scent of almonds, it's um, as a, in, by, it turns into hydrogen cyanide or prussic acid. So this is another very uh, lethal one. I still don't, the leaves are so close to bay leaves. I really don't know. I would not know how to tell them apart. So I think I would pass on figuring that out for myself. But the surprising thing, I was trying to think of another night bird because I already had two crows and an owl. And I thought of the whippoorwill and I just could not 
believe that James Thurber wrote a creepy, creepy story about the Whippoorwill. It's where I got the title, The Pale Edge of the Night. And as I closed there, the night had just begun to get pale around the edges when the Whippoorwill began. And the story really does not end well. And it's so hard to think that James Thurber wrote that because he's usually so funny. Um, but that's, that's another poisonous one we might not think of. Um, here's some more sketches. And it was a brandy mixer. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess, be daring. <laughs> um, suspects is what I call this, this grouping of them. Um, the castor bean plant, which is a very, very large leafed plant, um, also very common in public, um, public plantings in that it's very showy in the summer. But it is also is, well, it's a source to obviously castor oil. It's a source for um, industrial oils, mechanical oils, and it's also the source of ricin. Now, ricin's from the seeds and from everything I've read, it requires sort of a, a chemical thing. It's not like you just can't get your mortar and pestle and crush the seeds and you have ricin. I don't think. Although there was a person um, maybe about 10 years ago arrested in Coventry, south of Akron with um, attempting to make ricin <laughs> with castor bean plants. So I don't know. I, the umbrellas are for Georgi Markov who was the Bulgarian dissident that was killed in um, Russia, in Russia, in London. Um, and they felt that uh, it was never totally proven, but it's it's a pretty pretty good bet that he was um, injected with a pellet of ricin. Um, I believe maybe on the London Bridge. I'm not sure of that. The assassin's code name was Piccadilly, um, and that story just you know kind of stuck with me of that. So the next shows, um, I did printed this one then in a series of three. So I had suspects. I titled the first one. Um, and you can see the deceased down there <laughs> amid the amid the stalks. Um, the second version I did seeds. Um, and then the third one I added a, a little envelope for the the um one-time popularity of putting ricin in the mail. So, but that's not, that's another one I try to always pick up a castor bean plant in the summer and their, their pods are beautiful. Um, but yes, they're very poisonous. And the last one is a bit larger than those. Those were all the vertical format. Um, and this kind of goes back to the hemlock and the APACA, or it used to be called the umbelliferae family. Um, very large family, I think 3,700 species. This contains, it kind of reminds me of the nightshade, it contains some of our favorite spices and just infamous poisons, just hemlock being the first one. So here, there were so many, I couldn't decide on which one to do. And I already had done the pairings with the nightshade. So I read the quote, which is, should be coming up here. But I decided to put them in a circle and include more. So here's the picture of the block when I have all the plants already carved out, but I haven't quite decided what to do with the corners. And I put so much work <laughs> in the center part that I, probably was several weeks before I finally decided what was going to go in the corners. Um, I just didn't want to change my mind. You know, <laughs> that's a lot of cutting. And I don't know if you can tell, but it's done in four parts. So there's four 
um, nine by nine blocks that will, will fit all together to be printed. Um, the next one, let me see. There's the corners. I, I wound up putting crows in. So those are the corner crows. And this sort of shows you the idea I had for the printing. Um, the four blocks are cut. I did a um, practice print there. I had them all laid out and had, I had it all measured um, and fitted to plan it out so that it would hopefully come out the way I envisioned it. It's beautiful. Um, and the last one, or the second to the last one, here's the quote. And this is in a field guide book. It's in a book, you know, like we identify wild plants. And I, this, this is my favorite quote. The amateurs fooling with plants in the parsley family. I, it, it just makes me think twice about foraging because these plants, some of them look so similar from one to another, especially if you were out in the spring. Hemlock looks very much like Queen Anne's lace. Of course, if it's late in the summer, it's larger. It has a purpley stalk. You know, there are differences. It doesn't have the little the little red or purpley bloom in the middle like Queen Anne's lace. But if you were out in the spring, it would be very hard to tell them apart. Um, so on, on the circle, and I think there'll be one, one more. Well, we'll look at the next one. Um, if you go to the next one, I have the key to, the, to these. Um, Northeast, South, and West, like, and if you look, I added charms to this by hand. Uh, they're printed, but I printed them after I printed the whole big thing. So the four, the four Northeast, South, and West are your poisonous ones. I used, I know spiders aren't necessarily poisonous, but I used a spider and a skull. The chalice for Socrates is right next to the hemlock. And a dagger used to be a um, botanical symbol, symbol for poison. So at the top we have hemlock and the next poisonous one is to, to, the, um, to the right is water hemlock. And that's considered one of the most dangerous plants in the United States. I think the, the roots if people are foraging, they look very much like carrots. They're somewhat sweet, it is lethal. I don't think I've ever really seen it um, but it is. Uh, at the bottom is fool's parsley. I have never seen that either, I don't think. And then on the west would be um, which one? cow parsnip. The fact that so those are the four very poisonous ones. As you see in the list, the other ones, celery, carrots, you know, coriander, they're all things that we use in cooking in that. Um, another one that I didn't leave on that maybe you've heard of in recent years is giant hogweed. That would be, you know, very noticeable on how big it is, but it is very, um, I don't know that it would kill you. It probably just makes you wish you were dead. That's the one that raises all the blisters if it's on your skin or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's the largest one I did. Um, when I'm finished with this, there'll be a, a really short video because it's time lapse and it's Lily of the Valley, um, which is probably the next one I'm gonna do. I'll do the vertical format to go with this. I have a whole list of more. It's like, it just keeps growing and the stories are just wonderful. Um, there's a few quotes uh, that I got from different places. Um, of course, Agatha Christie and Poisons uh, and The Princess Bride. I thought that would that was suitable. So that's it. Um, up next, I think is a little. Uh,
oh, that's really going slow. <laughs> hmm. Is it lagging on you guys' end? It's really slow. This is normally is really fast. Yeah, hmm. I think it might be lagging over Zoom because it's fast on my end. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's funny. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Did it finish on your end? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, so was... if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, you can turn your mics on now, but you take your little cursor down to the bottom or side of your screen, hit your mic there and uh, you can unmute yourself so you can be able to ask questions if you would like to ask questions. Joan, how, how, how long does it take you to do what you just did in uh, fast forward? Uh, well, really, that thing really goes in two minutes, the fast forward. Um, it took me a little bit longer than normal. Uh, I really don't know the exact amount of time. But I found that I was working much slower when I had the camera. <laughs> the camera was intimidating me, you know. Um, but the, the most time I'm, on any of these, I swear, the most time is planning out the print. It just, the drawings, because I do many, many drawings. And I use a lot of tracing paper to make like small um, adjustments to it. And then deciding everything I do is black and white. So deciding the positive and negative. Once I get all that down, the rest is kind of zen. You know, carving it, you kind of get into it. And you don't, I don't, I couldn't even tell you the time. But sometimes that decision making, I will sit and stare at something. I left, like I left the herbal roulette for weeks with the corners undone. It was sitting here and I, I had several ideas, but I just was afraid to you know, commit. I was having commitment problems with it. <laughs> what, what are you actually cutting? What is that medium? That you it's, um, it's called Battleship Linoleum. Artists use it for relief prints. I do think that it one time it was I was told it was used in battleships that it's um, sort of cork based. Um, I also do wood cuts, but for consistency on these, I, I did them all and you get a more consistent um, finish. You did a lot of research. Oh, I love the research. <laughs> And I'm always coming across things. I was telling Carol the other day, though, I was going through stuff for this and I had a note and it said, Aztecs used for used this for ritual and something else, but I forgot to put the plant. So one of these days I'm going to come across the plant that the Aztecs used, but I had no clue why I wrote that down. <laughs> When you do a print series, how many do you usually print up in a? In a um, I print by hand, so 
usually around 10, but some I'll do maybe up to 25. Seldom, unless it's, unless it's something really small, seldom more than that. Okay. Um, I, keep, I keep the additions pretty small. So what you, that, I kept ahead. looking for poison ivy for some reason. Oh, well, poison ivy is a poison. I just haven't done it. Yes, it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely considered a poisonous plant. Poison oak, poison sumac. They're all, yep. What size tools do you use and where do you get them? Do you go to Utrecht? Um, I often use the, I use uh, speedball tools. The, the usual, I like to use those because you know, throw them away. Uh, I use the other ones, um, can't think of the name of it. The woodcut tools, which I also use, you have to sharpen. And it took me a long time to learn how to, to keep them sharp. They're not, you know, they're not disposable, they're expensive. Um, so it, there was a learning curve, learning to keep them sharpened enough to cut with and not totally ruin, ruining them. But they're V-shaped, there's V-shaped gouges and U-shaped gouges. I usually use a, not a really tiny one. I kind of tend to two, I use like a, a thick one, um, you might have seen in cleaning out the um, areas of the lily of the valley. And then I use like an outlining type, but there's, there's all different sizes. We have a question in the chat room. How many times can you use your linoleum plates? Uh, you can use those much longer than I would ever have the strength to print. I don't know, hundreds, I mean, hundreds. Okay. And if you had to press, um, you can, you know, you would be printing them out faster, but I'm very slow at printing. The other thing, um, I should have mentioned it when I had them up. Um, on some of them, like the, uh, the Monk's Hood, that series, when I printed them, oh, and the, um, the nightshade that was the picture, when I printed them, I purposely left some areas not really black. So I could adjust the pressure. That you can only do by hand. You know, I was, I would manipulate the ink on the block so that it wouldn't come out just solid black and solid white. Um, that's, that is an advantage to hand printing, but doing a large quantity, I just get tired of printing them. <laughs> but I have done, um, recently I did the little postcards for the museum's um, Akron art cards, the postcard thing, and they I hand printed mine. I had a lot of second thoughts about that because I could have just had them printed, but mine were hand printed crows and I did 120 of them. And I was really, my arms were really tired and it was only four by six inches, so. So you're not using a press. So you're no, using a I just use I just print by hand. And, and what is the what tool you're using over the top of the paper? It looked like a spoon. It was a wooden spoon. Oh, mm -hmm. you can use a wooden spoon. You can use um, a, a, a baron, which a lot of Chinese printing does, but I, I have a baron. I can't get enough pressure with it, really. Um, so I, yeah, I, I have this wooden spoon. It's got a really nice sheen to it now. It works just perfectly. I hope, you know, I don't lose it. From from doing so many, you know, rubbing it so many times, it's just got a nice finish on it. <laughs> have you Jill, experimented with other colors besides the black ink? I have, uh huh. But I really like black and white. But I do. I have. I do have done some print work that's in color. Mm -hmm. I like Jill, the graphic nature of black and white. I like the. Um, figuring out, you know, the, the play of the shapes in that. I, I wanted to, I just wanted to make a comment and then a question. Um, your, your, your work is so delicate and beautiful and detailed and just to appreciate it, just, you know, for the aesthetics of it, 
but then to hear the history behind each image and, and that makes you look even closer at what's there. Oh. I love the different, the different layers and levels that you can enjoy these pieces at. And my question is, how long have you been, you know, doing block prints and, you know, and what made you get interested in poisons? <laughs> oh, well, let me see. The block prints, I can tell you exactly when I started doing those. Um, well, other than in school, I mean, we did block prints in school and I do have, you know, I've done graphic work. I, I just like the graphic nature of block prints. Um, so I basically was a painter, um, mixed media and painting. And I'm trying to think, this is a, quite a number of years ago. And I was, I like to have um, often literary themes and I was working on a painting or a piece for every verse of 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens. And I, it just, I thought, wow, you know, I had done some, some paintings of those pieces and I thought these would make awesome block prints. That was the absolute first I did. And they were four by four. Um, each verse and it, you know, it remains one of my favorite, but ever since I did that, so that would have been, I don't know, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm not sure. Um, so for a, quite a while, I started doing block prints and paintings, often with the same themes. Um, and it just, it's really hard to retool the workspace for both. So in the last few years, I mainly been doing um, relief prints. The poison plant started, um, how many years ago was that? I found a dozen years ago and I was taking the master gardening classes and I was really getting into the herbs and learning about all the herbs. And then it just dawned on me one day that how many of these herbs just were, there was just such a fine line between the two. And that's when I started reading and researching. And it was just, you know, I mean, I knew nightshade and hemlock and the usual bad guys, but how they're all interconnected is just, to me, it's just fascinating. And then once I start reading and there's, you know, folklore, there's stories, there's gruesome stories, history, it's just, it's just so fascinating. And, you know, Kathy, our president is a, a landscape, <laughs> landscape <laughs> designer. <laughs> so, you know, you get to <laughs> Most of, these plants, <laughs> yeah, most of these plants aren't poisonous to touch. Aconitum can give you a little rash, but it's really if you ingest them. And mm -hmm. uh, so most of, most of us don't really go eat our landscape. Right, so right. We like yeah, because... not to eat the landscape plants. But, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and people have said that to me because I do have an area, you know, where I was trying some different some different poisonous and several people would say how can you have those poisonous plants I said well nobody's eating them you know <laughs> and not um not eating them but I did um a few years ago um uh, a really beautiful I guess it would be an herb is rue mm. um and now I know where, where it comes rue the day rue is and I'm not going to remember the scientific name but it's um it's a plant that if you touch it in the sunlight, it reacts with sunlight. It will give you a rash in that. And I knew that, but I never really, it never really sunk in until one day someone was over and we were, it was, it's a really beautiful plant. And I, <laughs> it was sunny and I reached in, you know, I'm fiddling with the leaves and that. The next day, it looked like I had poison ivy. It, that was serious, you know? <laughs> When they, say, when they say that, you know, don't touch it in the sun, don't touch it in the sun. <laughs> so I thought that that's, that's a good one, but I haven't done one of Rue either for the series and it, it's a really pretty plant. Who are your customers mostly? Pardon me? Who are your customers mostly? Just, are they plant people? 
Um, once in a while, but not necessarily. Some people just like the image for whatever, you know, like the um, um, best laid plans with, I know at least one of those sold to someone that loved chickens because it has a chicken in it. You know, you never know. You just never know. Well, Joan, tell us like where we can come to see your work and um, you know, when you're there and all of that. Well, I'm at Summit Art Space. Um, we're only, uh, we just started, we just reopened, but it's only on Saturday afternoons. Um, it's open noon to four. Uh, I often don't get there till closer to one, I will be honest. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, I'm always there. I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Um, I do have a website, which is probably not as up to date as it should be, but it does have a lot of work on it. You can look, that would be joancolbert.com. Um, and if anybody wants, um, like I can send you the, pay, it's not paper, but I can send you a printout thing with what I did tonight as soon as I make that correction. So if anybody contacts me that would like to see um, the images, since we can't do handouts. <laughs> um, but then today I saw that error and I thought, oh no, <laughs> I have to correct that. As if we, any of us would notice. <laughs> yeah. You know, I knew, I knew <laughs> it's so much quicker when you, when something's going to be formatted to just cut and paste and then change it. And I just kept thinking, don't forget to change one. And of course I did. So. Do you put your uh, initials somewhere on the piece? No, I sign them. Um, okay. That's all. Vince, are you gonna put the presentation up on the website? I could do that. Um, yeah. Yes, I can, I can do that if everybody would like that. Oh, that'd be wonderful to be able to watch it again. Okay, and if anybody wants um, a paper copy, let me know. Or, you know, a, a printable, or they can look at it, you can look at it on your computer. Oh, that'd be yeah, nice. Joan if, Joan, if you could send me the, the corrected uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yes. I can, I can put <laughs> I will it do up, that. up with I will the do that. video. Thank you. Yes. Yep. I don't like errors. <laughs> yep. Understand. Joan, well, what kind of ink do you use? Mm hmm. What kind of ink do you use? When um, you I use um, uh, multiple brands of, because it's black, um, but I use oil-based ink. Oh, okay. So that's one reason I don't do, um, if you come to Summit Art Space, I don't do, I can take in a block there and work on it, but I don't do any printing there because it's, it's pretty stinky uh, oil-based ink. Oh, okay. So, and I have plenty of room to work, you know, at home, so. Your work is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I didn't yak too much. <laughs> I got going on these plants and it's so, you know, it's just so interesting. Well, it's, that's so that wonderful. is obvious. Too. Yeah. Wonderful. I keep thinking of Agatha Christie who would want to put some of those plants to good use. She has. <laughs> she definitely has. Um, I'm trying to remember. I should have written it down in my brain. I think Cherry Laurel is one of Agatha Christie's ones that she used with the scent of almonds and that, but I can't remember which story it was. Um, Didn't she work in a hospital and that's where she got to, to oh. become familiar with yeah. all the poisons and the effects of the poisons. And then she decided to put them in her stories. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Joan, your work is just Definitely. incredible. I'm so happy that you were able to join us and that you, Thank you. presented us with that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, it's You just have to see her work in person though. You, you need to go visit her little studio because it's, <laughs> you don't want to leave. <laughs> yeah, very, very enjoyable. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much Yay. for having me. Yay. And I will get the link to to fun. you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Joan. Thanks. Good night. Bye.